Looming above the cold pathway through the world's edge mountains known as Peak Pass resides the dwarf fortress called Karak Kadrin. This imposing stronghold has always defended the pass from tides of greenskins, roaming monsters, and the occasional horde of chaos. Karak Kadrin, meaning Stronghold of the Mountain Pass, goes more commonly by another name, however. It is called the Slayer Keep, and for good reason. The largest shrine to Grimner was constructed here, and has functioned as the gathering place for the infamous Slayer Cult of the Dwarves. Many come here to have their mighty deeds recorded, visit the priests to seek guidance, or put themselves to work by entering the jagged peaks looking for monstrous foes to slay. However, Kalak Kadrin likely received its more common title due to the line of rulers that have reigned over the fortress for the last 3,000 years. The current lord of the Slayer Keep is none other than King Ungrim Ironfist, who is likely the last Slayer King. Ungrim's story begins much earlier than his birth, for his royal line has long been cursed with calamity and is full of woe. It was King Baragor, Ungrim's five times great-grandsire, who suffered a loss so great that it drove him to take the Slayer Oath. Although what caused this drastic decision was not recorded by the dwarves, it is widely believed that it was the murder of his daughter that pushed the king to feeling such shame. Baragor's daughter was on her way to marry the son of the high king of Karazakarak at the time, led by a mighty escort from Karakadrin, which also quite likely carried bountiful treasures as a dowry. However, in those dark times, a great evil roamed the land, which had a great appetite for dwarf flesh and gold. Upon this throng of dwarves descended Skaladrak Incarnadin, the most powerful dragon to ever plague the old world. The dwarves were slaughtered, and the princess of Kalakadrin died with them. When word reached Baragor, he was devastated. Not only had the king lost his beloved daughter, but he had also cost his hold dearly, for surely the marriage to the High King's son would have greatly strengthened the hold's relationship with the Everpeak. Distraught that he hadn't sent a larger force or been there himself to fight the terrible dragon, King Baragor did the only thing a dwarf can do. 650 years before the birth of Sigmar, he swore the Slayer Oath hoping to one day find redemption for his failure in becoming the first Slayer King. Baragor was torn, however, for there was a complication with this act, for his oaths were now in direct conflict. The Slayer Oath to seek out death and the oath as king to protect his people. In the end, King Baragor found a way to satisfy both vows by founding the Slayer Shrine of Karakadrin, which is the largest shrine to Grimner ever constructed. With this, he created a haven for slayers that allows them a place to gather and seek various types of aid or guidance. With this wise act completed, Baragor took on the name Ungrim, which roughly translates to a dwarf who has not yet fulfilled an important oath. Unfortunately, the oath of Grimner can only be fulfilled by a worthy death in battle, which Baragor was unable to accomplish. Thus, his oath was passed down to his son, who also took on the name Ungrim. This tradition has continued for almost 3,000 years to the modern age with King Ungrim Ironfist. Now for the actual history of Ironfist himself. The current ruler of Karakadrin is without a doubt one of the fiercest Dawi to ever walk the Warhammer world. There are few monsters roaming the old world he has not slaughtered, and many a foe has been hewed down by his mighty axe. Ungrim is in the ballpark of being 250 to roughly 400 years old, and has lived a life almost completely full of slaughtering monstrous foes and endless armies. Very little is actually recorded about his early life, though Ungrim is noted as having been a fiery and adventurous prince who often didn't heed his father's words. While still a prince, Ungrim was invited to the Council of Kings summoned by High King Alrikson that was called immediately following the victory in Kislev against the hordes of Azavar Kul. The great war against Chaos had taken a heavy toll on High King Alrikson, and although he had succeeded in aiding Magnus the Pious, 
the Dwarf King realized that he was dying. His only son had died in Kislev, and everywhere the king looked he saw weakness and greed consuming the Dawi. They needed a new High King, who would lead them out of this oncoming darkness. Thus, he called the Council of Kings in Karazakarak, summoning every hold to send representatives and princes to the Everpeak. Here, all of the princes, including Ungrim Ironfist, repeated their oaths of loyalty to the High King, and listened to his plan to name a successor. All of the candidates would be given one year to achieve mighty deeds, after which they would return to Karazakarak and present their accomplishments to the Council of Elders. After deliberation, a new High King would reign. For a year, Iron Fist wandered the treacherous mountains around Peak Pass and further beyond, slaughtering every great beast he came across. He killed scores of trolls, struck down large orc war bosses, and cleaved indescribable horrors in the deep, dark places of the earth. Eventually, though, he finally found a beast worthy of his axe. Ungrim finally came across a giant of immense size, a terrible brute that could easily crush a rank of dwarves beneath his feet. The young dwarf took one long look at the monster before charging forward with an eager cry. It was an epic battle, as the titanic monster attempted to pulp Ungrim into ruin, but the stalwart dwarf was quick, as well as powerful, and bit by bit hacked the giant to death. In the end, he removed the beast's head with a few well-placed blows. Finally, the Council of Kings convened once more, and as celebratory kegs were opened, each contestant for the throne presented his mighty deeds. None present received greater cheers than Ungrim, for the giant's head took a score of dwarves just to drag into the Great Hall. He seemed a favorable pick for High King, but that's when Thorgrim Grudgebearer arrived. We will speak of Grudgebearer's deeds another day, but such was his success that even Ungrim's mighty kill paled in comparison. The prince held no ill will towards Thorgrim, for even he acknowledged Grudgebearer's amazing accomplishments. After the council concluded, Prince Ungrim returned home to Karak Kadrin, hailed as a hero for his great deeds. High King Alrikson died quickly afterwards, and Thorgrim was crowned as the Lord of the Karaz Ankor. When he attended the coronation ceremony, Ungrim heard the mighty words of Thorgrim, and felt his heart moved by the High King's fiery words. Thorgrim demanded that the dwarves march out to reclaim their realm once more, and face their foul enemies with cannon and axe. If nothing else, Ungrim left the Everpeak with a burning desire for battle and glory. It is unclear after this when exactly Ungrim became king of Karak Kadrin. Virtually nothing is recorded of his father, including the date of his death. At any rate, however, King Ungrim Ironfist set about making his Karak into the greatest fortress in the world. He set the smiths to forging mighty weapons of war, trained his throngs to skill beyond measure, and called all slayers to seek battle near him. It was during these early years of his rule that Ungrim began searching for a wife. Eventually, the Donarkun clan, a clan highly respected and full of royal blood, offered one of their fair Rin to be the king's wife. Kema was no ordinary dwarf woman, however, for she wielded a hammer and shield better than most longbeards. Her chaperones were slain early on by Groby, but rather than flee or despair, Kema simply cut a swath of ruin through the goblins of the mountains. When she announced herself at the gates of Karak Kadrin, she paid her dowry in a dozen goblin skulls and a sack full of gold. Ungrim took her immediately for his wife, for surely there could be no better woman for a slayer king. Soon after, Ungrim had a son on the way, but this is when the Slayer King began his famous rampage of slaughter against the world's monsters. This culminated in his incredible feat of slaying the Dragon of Black Peak, earning himself the mighty rank of Dragon Slayer. When his son was born, Kema and Ungrim decided to name their boy Garagrim, which roughly translates to a fearless and unyielding dwarf 
though it has an implication of rebelliousness that would prove to be a portent. Garagrim was a major part of Ungrim's life, for he wanted more than anything not to pass on Baragor's slayer oath to his son. King Ironfist wanted his son to be a strong and honorable ruler, free of that taint and able to lead Karak Kadrin into a golden age. As such, he kept seeking more and more dangerous battles in order to fulfill his oath. Despite his best efforts, however, Ungrim was always thwarted by either fate or loved ones. He nearly met his sought-after doom while on a scouting mission that wandered far too close to Karak Ungor, also known as Red Eye Mountain. Here, he ended up fighting a massive greenskin horde, led by a huge orc named Bashrak, alongside a small group of rangers and slayers. One by one, all of the dwarves were slain except for Ungrim and his dear friend, Gotrek Gurnison. As they battled upon a high bridge, Iron Fist was certain he had finally met his end. But before a killing blow could be struck, Gotrek saved the king by cutting the bridge, sending Bashrak and much of his horde to their deaths. Ungrim never forgave Gotrek for that, for denying a slayer his doom is a mighty sin in dwarf culture. But Gotrek had sworn an oath to Queen Kemma Ironfist that he would save Ungrim if he could do so, and an oath was fulfilled. Despite this, many of Ironfist's battles helped the Karas Ankor. Years later, Ungrim accomplished a great victory for the dwarves when he marched out to the aid of King Belagar Ironhammer at Karak Eight Peaks. The Skaven had managed to surround the dwarves in their part of the fallen fortress, and were laying siege with all sorts of foul machines and monsters. Ungrim made great speed and arrived in time to take the fight to the Ratmen, being led by the infamous Queek Headtaker. As Ungrim's forces slammed into the rear of the Skaven army, Belagar surged out from his fortress and the Ratmen of Clan Moors were butchered. Although Queek managed to escape, the king of Karakadrin had bought his kin some much-needed relief. Ungrim returned home, and many more years would pass before his next recorded battle, one that would prove to be his mightiest victory. A rather clever orc by the name of Nashrak Badtooth was rampaging around the World's Edge Mountains and had been doing so for a considerable amount of time. Much to the High King's rage, the orc warboss had managed to continue eluding Thorgrim's army, hell-bent on retribution. Always eager for a fight, Ungrim gathered his army and marched out to find and slay the brute. Three times Ungrim's army found and defeated the Greenskin Horde, but each time the orcs managed to escape mostly due to a massive ogre contingent. After the third battle, however, Nashrak had a rather nasty argument with the ogre captain, a mighty creature named Golgfag Maneater. After the falling out, Golgfag and his ogres decided to switch sides and came to Ungrim, offering their services and delivering Nashrak's arm as proof of their questionable loyalty. Iron Fist accepted Golgfag's assistance, and between the two armies the Greenskins were utterly obliterated at the Battle of Broken Leg Gully. Before leaving, however, Golgfag decided to reward himself extra and looted Ungrim's baggage train. The King of Karakadrin swore he would have vengeance. Simmering with rage over the ogre's betrayal, Ungrim returned to his hold to find more bad news. His son Garagrim, now grown into a proper warrior and prince, decided to take the Slayer Oath against both of his parents' wishes. Garagrim believed that if he could die before Ungrim, he would free both his mother and father of their oath. Of course, this only exasperated the king, who saw this as needless folly for his son did not need to take the oath until he became king, if Ungrim failed to find a worthy doom. This remained a large arguing point between the two of them. In the following years, Karak Kadrin would face the most dangerous foe to ever attack its mighty walls. A massive chaos host, the largest seen since the Great War against Azavar Kul, marched south through the mountains under the banner of Garmer the Gorewolf. A terrifying champion of Khorne, Garmer was seeking to tear open an entrance to the realm of chaos at Karak Kadrin. 
During this time, Ungrim was begrudgingly aided by none other than Gotrek and Felix. The siege was destructive, as Garmer's Cornite Horde also had a contingent of Chaos Dwarves with their nefarious war machines. At the climax of the final battle, Ungrim nearly found his doom against a Chaos Slaughter Brute called the Slaughterhound. Before he died, however, the king was captured so that he could be sacrificed to Korn. When Gotrek and Felix arrived to confront Garmer, they managed to cause a distraction as madness and infighting took over the Chaos encampment. Ungrim easily slaughtered his jailers, despite being tired and chained up. But before he could join in the final battle, Gotrek forced him away from the lines, once more denying the Slayer King his doom. Though Gotrek and Felix ultimately slew Garmer the Gorewolf and his pet Slaughter Brute, they ended up leaving the battle well before its end. What occurred then is unrecorded, though it is suggested that this is when Prince Garagrim Ironfist of Karak Kadrin found his doom. He was likely slaying one of the massive Chaos Siege Giants of the Chaos Dwarves, his death blow on the monster trapping him as its immense bulk crushed him. Truly, it was a mighty doom. Robbed of both his doom and his son, Ungrim was filled with grief. With Garagrim's death, the Slayer Oath of King Baragor had finally been fulfilled. But at what cost? Consumed with shame for a failure all too similar to his ancestors, Iron Fist did the only thing an honorable dwarf could do. For failing to protect his son, he once more swore the Slayer Oath. With Garagrim gone, Ungrim could rest knowing he was the last Slayer King. The other members of the Drakebeard clan eyed the throne hungrily, as they knew now that since he didn't have a direct heir, Ungrim would need to select one. Thus did his hold's mightiest clans marshal to greater acts of heroism and valor to prove themselves the wisest pick. The Slayer King had no interest in such thoughts, however, and sought something to occupy his troubled mind. Thus he turned his attention to hunting for a certain mercenary who he had sworn to hunt down. Although it took five years from the end of the Battle of Broken Leg Gully, Ungrim finally had his chance for revenge. Although we'll go more into detail in the famous battle section, needless to say Golgfag made a poor decision trying to go through Peak's Pass underneath Karak Kadrin's watchful gaze. With the ogre dealt with, Ungrim threw himself into battle wherever he could. Iron Fist constantly sought opportunities to lead his throng to any war he could find, culling the area around Karakadrin of enemies. He began to wander further afield, and chased his enemies until they were cut down. One such time, he harried an orc army until he managed to bring the Greenskins to battle on the edge of Athel Loren. The dwarves were vastly outnumbered, and slowly were being ground down. Perhaps at last Ungrim had found his great doom. Yet once more fate denied him, as a host of wood elves led by Thalindor Doomstar erupted from the forest to aid the mountain folk. The greenskins were slaughtered, but as victory was claimed, Ungrim's rage at having his doom denied gave way to darker thoughts. Seeking to repay millennia-old debts against his hold, Ungrim led his throng against the elves, cutting them down without mercy. Enraged, Thalindor fled back into the forest, promising vengeance. Unfortunately for Ungrim, Thalindor kept his word and rallied a mighty host to lay siege to the outer workings of Karak Kadrin. Careful to stay out of war machine range and casting back the many sorties sent from the keep with arrow and magic, the Wood Elves maintained their blockade and even twice repelled Zuffbar's armies from breaking the siege. Satisfied the debt was settled, Thalindor retreated with his host only after a year of siege. With the cowardly elves gone, Ungrim was itching for a battle, and was all too eager when word arrived that Zuffbar was under siege. The Slayer King gathered up his throngs and marched south at the head of a great host, ready to slay all in his path. On his way to Zuffbar, Iron Fist encountered another mighty throng, being led by his friend, High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer. The two armies marched side by side with haste to their allied hold. 
What both kings failed to realize is that although Zuthbar was in fact under siege by Greenskins, the dwarves were so unthreatened by the horde that they were thankful the orcs provided live target practice for some new inventions of the Engineers Guild. When the throngs of Karak Kadren and Karazakarak arrived, the orcs were brutally slaughtered. However, this was when none other than Joseph Bugman arrived, who informed the gathered kings that he had discovered the reason for the Greenskin invasion. The orcs were simply an effect of a larger problem which was a massive ogre army led by a tyrant named Brol Lumphammer heading straight for the moot. Thanks to the legendary ranger's knowledge of secret mountain passes, the combined horde of three dwarven holds arrived in time to head off the ogres at the river Aver. As tyrant Lumphammer led one of the mightiest ogre armies to see the old world across the river, another large army of men from Noln arrived on the far bank. Thus started the Battle of a Hundred Cannons, when the largest collection of artillery the Old World had and would ever see open fire on the Ogres. Those not completely obliterated that managed to survive the storm of cannonballs were butchered by the Dwarves. Ungrim likely thought shooting most of the Ogres was rather unsporting. With that victory concluded, Ungrim returned home to Karakadrin once more, though this time he sensed something wrong. The world was changing, and dark times were ahead. Foul monsters were awakening from the depths of the world, massive armies of madness were on the march, and the winds of magic blew strong. While most grumbled in concern or whispered in fear that the end times were coming, Ungrim could only grin and hope they were right. Alright then, with the history of Ungrim Ironfist covered, let's go ahead and move on to his equipment. When the Slayer King carves a red ruin into his foes while singing songs of old, he relies upon the axe of Dargo to butcher anything standing in his way. This runic axe is one of the largest of its kind, a massive weapon forged from the shards of King Baragor's own broken rune axe. How King Baragor shattered his axe is unclear. Perhaps he did it in rage at the loss of his daughter, or maybe against the hide of some terrible beast. Regardless, the Axe of Dargo is a physical representation of Baragor's oath, as Dargo translates to roughly a beast's challenge. When it was forged, the runesmith responsible tempered the molten metal with dragon's blood, and iron oaths of vengeance. The rune inscribed onto the Axe of Dargo appears to be a master rune variant of the Rune of Cleaving, or something of similar working as it augments Ungrim's already great strength and can cleave through armor for killing blows with ease. Though Iron Fist's weapon was not the only thing he inherited from his ancestors, for when he became king he was also given the Slayer Crown. This is a majestic runic helmet that has great curving horns and has been set with a golden crown. It's also specially designed to allow the Slayer King's famous red crest to stand without inhibition. This armor piece was forged after Baragor swore his oath, and has been worn by every single Slayer King since. Along with its marvelous craftsmanship and defensive qualities, this Gromeral helm has been inscribed with a variant of the Rune of Iron, making Ungrim's flesh as tough as a dragon's hide. Ungrim is protected by more than just his Gromril armor, however, for from his shoulders hangs the dragon cloak of Firskar. Roughly 1500 years before the modern age, a mighty dwarf hero named Doran Heldor slew the mighty dragon named Firskar. Firskar was one of Skaladrak's offspring, and thus the dwarves rejoiced at its death. Doran skinned the foul creature and brought its skin to High King Finn Sourscowl at Karazakarak. Here it was engraved with potent runes and placed carefully within the Everpeak's vaults for millennia. However, after the Battle of Broken Leg Gully, High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer was quite pleased to learn of Nashrak's death. For his great victory in slaying the Greenskins, Ungrim was gifted the Dragon Cloak which is now an heirloom of Karakadrin, and is a symbol of vows already fulfilled. It was inscribed with the mightiest possible rune of warding, 
which is said to be incredibly difficult for even the mightiest of rune lords. Being made of dragon scales, the cloak also makes Ungrim virtually immune to even the hottest of flames. With the dragon cloak, he is protected from almost any harm, as the runes flare to life to turn aside the strongest of blows and the foulest of magics. Being the Slayer King, Ungrim has a habit of attracting large amounts of the Doom Seekers to his throngs. In battle, Ungrim often prefers to only fight alongside his fellow Slayers, much to the irritation of his Hammerers and various Thanes. When Iron Fist marches to war, often the banners of the Shrine of Grimner itself are unleashed, potent runic standards capable of incredible feats of power. A final important piece of Ungrim's background is his clan. Their symbol is that of a writhing bearded dragon with Grimner's seal behind it, and their colors are deep red to signify them as loyal to Karakadrin. The dwarves of the Drakebeard clan are infamous for being exceptionally grudge-ridden folk, even for dwarves. Their fiery-hearted thanes can often be found scouring Peak Pass, looking for opportunities to prove themselves. With the death of Garagrim leaving Iron Fist with no direct heir, his clan is full of young thanes attempting to accomplish greater and greater feats. Now that King Ungrim's equipment is out of the way, Let's move forward to his equipment. Iron Fist is without a doubt the greatest warrior of the Karaz Ankor in the modern age. His skill in battle is unmatched by any dwarf save perhaps Gotrek Gurnison, for Ungrim has dedicated his entire life to sharpening his skill in battle, and it shows. The skill he's able to wield the axe of Dargo with can only be countered by the greatest heroes of the elves and the most powerful lords of chaos. Ungrim has butchered mighty warlords and terrifying monsters with ease, cutting down his foes in a hurricane of blade and ruin. Beyond his great skill as a warrior, Ungrim is also immensely strong thanks to the runic enchantments bound into his blade. These runes bolster his might to be equal to that of a dragon, capable of smashing aside the strongest of defenses and obliterating ranks of enemies. There is no armor or hide too tough for Ungrim to crack. Part of being a slayer means to live a life seeking out the mightiest of foes in epic confrontations. For those slayers who are unfortunate enough to fail in finding their doom, they only grow stronger and stronger with each foe slain. They learn the weak points of their enemies and strike them down with relentless wrath. Ungrim has slain more terrible foes in the Dawi than any of his race. Because of this, King Iron Fist is a master at placing his blows to cause the maximum damage, shifting what normally would have been a glancing strike to a death blow. He can butcher giants and dragons in a swift flurry of attacks or decapitate enemy warlords with a single swing. Beyond that, Ungrim has also achieved the rank of Demon Slayer, which means that the very world itself stabilizes around him. This causes the winds of magic themselves to still, disrupting protective amulets and the unstable aura of demons long enough to guarantee a killing blow against creatures who believe themselves immortal. Something truly unique about Ungrim is that he wears a full set of Gromril armor when marching to war. He is the only slayer to do so, for most Doom Seekers see wearing armor as an unnecessary inhibition to achieving their doom. Ungrim is a king, however, and has a duty to his people to survive even as he seeks his death. Thus, between his full armor, the slayer crown, and the wards carved into the dragon cloak, Ungrim has an absurd amount of defense. He can take a blow from a giant without so much as flinching, and far too many weapons have failed to breach the defensive aura generated by the dragon cloak. Truly, he is a terrifying foe upon the battlefield. Speaking of which, when it comes to leadership, Ungrim is no slouch. Although he's capable of sitting back and giving orders to turn the tide of sieges and battles, Iron Fist often prefers to wade into the thick of things. The Slayer King nearly always leads from the front, butchering his way through the enemy line and bolstering the courage of his troops with his valorous axe. He's a brilliant tactician in general, 
though most strategic problems that face him seem to be easily solved with a few swings of his axe. Although King Iron Fist is a gifted and courageous warrior, there is an important flaw he suffers from. Ungrim has been a slayer since taking the crown, and his constant attempts to seek his doom have created a dangerous sort of madness within him. Ungrim is so eager to battle that he often sends expeditions out recklessly to antagonize the servants of chaos in the north or the greenskins to the east, making sure these groups carry with them obvious symbols of the Slayer Keep. He does this to force his enemies to come to him so he can continue to fight, though in reality this puts his hold in needless danger. Despite this problem, however, the Slayer Madness does have one notable benefit. This desire to seek a glorious death in battle has rendered Ungrim utterly immune to fear and panic, and he welcomes being grossly outnumbered or facing a terrifying foe. The Slayer King will never flee willingly, and will brace his axe against any who dare threaten his people. Finally, although speed isn't a noteworthy trait of the dwarves, it should be said that Ungrim is alarmingly fast for one. Although he's nowhere near the supernatural speed of the elves, Iron Fist is much quicker than most of his kin, which has surprised more than a few of his enemies. Underestimating Ungrim's speed has cost quite a few mighty foes their lives, for the Slayer King can erupt into a deadly whirlwind of steel at a moment's notice. With skills now done, let's go ahead and move on to a famous battle. After the Battle of Broken Leg Gully, Ungrim waited patiently for his chance to get revenge on Golgfag Maneater for the ogre's betrayal. It took five years for an opportunity to present itself, but when it did, Iron Fist was all too happy to take it. Golgfag was starting a journey out of the Old World back to the East, likely heading towards the Ogre Kingdoms in the Mountains of Morn. Leading his mercenary force, the Ogre Captain decided to take the shortest route towards the Darklands, and decided to pass through Peak Pass. It didn't occur to him that Karak Kadrin was always watching this pass, and a certain king was all too eager upon hearing that Goldfag was coming. King Ironfist went to the Shrine of Grimner and gathered up all of the slayers he could find, promising them a worthy doom against the Ogre Horde. With exactly 100 Doom Seekers behind him, Ungrim led his small army down into Peak Pass and waited for the faithless Ungak to arrive. Goldfag's army didn't have to venture far before discovering the narrow pass, blocked by Iron Fist and his angry kin. The Ogre Captain laughed when he realized the Ogres easily outnumbered the Slayers and ordered his force to butcher the Dwarves. For his part, Ungrim was only concerned about one thing. He was disappointed there weren't more ogres. The slayers charged forwards with a battle cry and slammed home into the ogre line with axes and hammers flailing. Although a number of the slayers went to their ancestors from being pulped by clubs or crushed by the ogre's gut plates, the fat monsters fared far worse. Ungrim was like Grimner Reborn, killing an ogre with each swing of the axe of Dargo. His weapon felled them like blubbery trees, splitting iron gut plates like brittle lead as he continued forward without pause. Any ogre that managed to avoid the axe of the king fared no better as the slayers butchered them while howling with rage. King Iron Fist began singing a dwarfen dirge in his booming voice his axe striking down a monster in time with each beat. The slayers joined their own voices in, and soon the pass reverberated with their song, with punctuations of ogre death howls and the wet crunching of axe meeting flesh. Golgfag could only gape in terror as the orange-crested avatar of vengeance hewed towards him, making a mockery of the most elite ogre man-eater force the world had ever seen. As the last ogre between Golgfag and Ungrim fell, the captain raised his weapon and charged the Slayer King. Iron Fist met the ogre's strength head-on, swinging his axe up to meet the twin weapons of Golgfag descending with crushing power. As the weapons smashed into one another, there was a shearing of metal as the axe of Dargo cleaved through the ogre's weapons, stumbling Golgfag. Before he could recover, Ungrim stepped forward and headbutted the ogre with a sickening crunch. 
Goldfag stood for a moment before dropping over like a felled tree. The Slayer King grunted with satisfaction and turned to see the Slayers finishing off the remainder of the mercenaries. It had been a good fight. Goldfag was captured and thrown into the dungeons of Kalak Kadrin to rot. After a few months, Ungrim Ironfist decided to release the Ogre Captain, declaring it would be more sporting to hunt him down later. Thus did Maneater flee back to the Ogre Kingdoms, his debt with Iron Fist settled. And now, as always, we will go ahead and move on to the End Times portion. Um, if you're not a big fan of the End Times, or you want to avoid spoilers, I'll put an annotation right around Ungrim's face that you can click on, and it will skip you to the next portion. Uh, so at the End of Times, um, during the beginning of it, the dwarves were summoned for a Council of Kings in Karazakarak where Thorgrim essentially wanted them to vote to decide what action the dwarves would take in the darkened times to come. Essentially, it was a big vote between marching out to fight alongside their allies like the Empire and semi-abandoning the holds, or to just hole up like dwarves tend to do. Uh, some of the holds like Karak Azul and Karak Eight Peaks voted that they wanted to stay within their holds and not help the wider world, while others, like Ungrim Ironfist and Thorgrim Grudgebearer, wanted to go out and fight alongside their old allies against the end of days. In the end, uh, Ungrim went back to Katakadrin because Thorgrim lost the vote and decided to stay within his hold. Uh, that being said, Ungrim did not sit idle for long as the Skaven began erupting all over the world and continuously attempted to besiege Karak Kadrin. Unfortunately for the Skaven, Ungrim was always looking for a fight and wasn't interested in just sitting in his hold waiting for them. So as soon as they appeared, he would lead his throng of slayers out and just butcher everything in sight. This prevented the Skaven from actually setting up an effective war machine line so they couldn't properly lay siege to Karak Kadrin. That being said, eventually the a very, very large combined army of Clan Mulder and Clan Skorir arrived. The Mulder section, which had been there for a while, was being led by Throt the Unclean, and Ikit Claw had arrived from Karak Eight Peaks to finish off the hold. Uh, as they built up their war machines and prepared to finish off Karak Kadrin, Ungrim Ironfist led a huge army out of the gates and smashed the war machines and started destroying the Skaven line. However, in this final part of the battle, Ikit had one final trick up his sleeve and planted these massive versions of warp gas globes inside of three of Throt's abominations. And when I say massive, these things were, if regular warp uh, globadiers are throwing like grenades with enough gas to cover uh, a small area of like three to five yards in poisonous gas, these things were nukes. Uh, of the three abominations, one of them died trying to get to the wall due to war machine fire, another uh, and the, as the other two ripped open the gates, one died there, but his bomb went off inside of the hold, killing a lot of people, and the third abomination managed to pull itself into the hold, where then the gas inside of it exploded, it died, came back to life, because it's an abomination, ran, among the hold, ran around the hold, spreading that poisonous gas, died again, came back to life again, and then managed to drag itself further down before it finally died. Uh, due to the third A-bomb making it so deep into the hold, everyone inside was killed. There were no survivors. Racked with grief and hatred, Ungrim visited the Shrine of Grimner one final time to swear an oath once more of ultimate rage and vengeance. However, as he was visiting the Shrine of Grimner, the metal reacted to him swearing this final oath, and his burning, fiery vengeance and hatred, the runes leapt to life and entered him. What he did not realize was that this was the wind of Akshi that had escaped Ulthuan from the vortex when Teclas unbound it. Uh, this is also known as the wind of fire. Thus, Ungrim became the incarnate of fire. 
and with every word and bellow that he spoke, fire would erupt, and his mane was made of fire, and fire licked off his axe. And with his newfound power, he wandered around Karakadrin and burnt it to the ground, turning it into a massive funeral pyre, for there was no way to bury all of the dead. But that was enough of solace for him and his now entirely uh, slayer force. In the end, he decided to head towards Karazakarak after hearing there was a large siege going on there, and he arrived in time to see the largest Skaven army to ever gather, uh, being led by Ikit Claw and Queek Headtaker. He ran into the fighting and destroyed a massive portion of the Skaven army, um, and he defeated Ikit Claw by basically vomiting a bunch of fire on him, well, bellowing a bunch of fire at him which caused Ikit's metal suit, metal armor, to fuse to his flesh and essentially burned him. Uh, it did not kill Ikit, but it did wound him severely. After the Everpeak was saved, Ungrim heard from Joseph Bugman that the Emperor had retreated to Averheim and was rallying there for, to face off against Archaon Everchosen. Ungrim decided to march his force there immediately, and when he left, he essentially took... All the dwarves with him that decided that they wanted to have one final... They wanted to fight alongside humanity and be active against the enemy rather than hide away. Uh, when he arrived, he met the Zafbarak, which were a very large dwarf army and throng from, that survived the fall of Zafbar, who had also come to Aperheim to help and was led by an extremely powerful rune lord. Uh, these dwarf armies both joined Karl Franz and helped him battle against the Tides of Chaos at Averheim. Uh, Ungrim and his dwarves held an entire section of the wall for quite some time. Um, originally it was against Vil Village the Cursling, but he was defeated. Um, and then almost immediately afterwards, uh, Archaon showed up and Archaon brought his... This was when Archaon declared himself solely for Korn and brought a massive Kornite army. Um, when the Cornite army erupted into Averheim, it was an army of billions versus an army of maybe thousands. Uh, in the end, uh, Ungrim pretty much decimated his part of the wall. Uh, there was a number of powerful monsters and creatures and warriors that tried to take him on, but he was just a god of a warrior, slaughtering things left and right. Uh, he eventually went up against the uh, Warriors of Chaos special character Skyla Anfingrim, which is a massive chaos spawn of Korn and is the most powerful of its kind. Uh, it attempted to kill Ungrim, but he managed to outwit it, wound it mortally, and when it tried to do its final charge against it, he ducked underneath sliced open its belly so that it rammed into a wall at crushing speed, and then it fell off the walls to its death. Uh, at this point, it became rather apparent the city was lost. Uh, Karl Franz ended up dueling against Archeon, and before anyone could get to them, Archeon managed to strip the Wind of Heavens from Karl Franz, rendering him extremely vulnerable. Uh, this is when Gelt approximately returned to the city and activated his super spell for the first time, the Crucible, which he used to teleport all of the dwarves to being immediately around Karl Franz. Uh, and the way it worked is it turns you into metal, melts you down, and brings you back somewhere else as a metal statue, and then it returns you to normal. Um, obviously, it's a dangerous spell, and it's not perfect, and many of the people... Some of the people who, some of the dwarves who returned to metal stayed that way, unfortunately. But it was worth the price as Archaon swung the Slayer of Kings down for the final blow. Ungrim was the one who rushed up and saved Karl Franz, deflecting the blow and then engaging uh, Archaon in a pretty intense duel. Uh, the two continued to fight and were very even. Um, Archaon was not able to take his eyes off Ungrim and try and go for that killing blow on. Uh, Karl Franz, due to the fact that if he took his eye off Ungrim for a second, he knew Ungrim was probably going to decapitate him. In the end, uh, Gelt summoned a magical barrier around all of them, which separated the fighting between Ungrim and Archeon for a moment, much to Ungrim's irritation, and they made a plan for escape. 
Unfortunately, it was not possible for Gelt to get everyone out of Averheim. So Ungrim Iron Fist, the Incarnate of Fire, offered for him and his horde of slayers to stay behind as they wanted to seek a mighty doom anyway, and they could buy the other forces of order enough time. Uh, it's heavily insinuated during this part that had Karl Franz managed to keep the Lore of Heavens until Ungrim had reached him, the two of them could have killed Archeon Everchosen. As it was, uh, Archeon was at full strength, and it was impossible for a single incarnate to kill him. And with Karl Franz having lost the lore of heavens, he was essentially just a regular man. Uh, a skilled man, but just a man. And even with him, Ungrim, they would not be able to land a killing blow on Archeon. Hold him off, probably, but the billions of warriors with him, no. So in the end, uh, Gelt teleported them all out of the city, and Ungrim ran forward and engaged Archeon one final time. The battle between them was extremely epic. But in the end, he unfortunately uh, was defeated and was struck down by the Lord of the End Times. Not to be one to not have a final say, however, Ungrim's Lore of Fire went out in a very vengeful way, and when he died, it essentially went up in a giant plume of flame that could be seen for miles, because Vlad von Karstein saw it from a huge distance away. And... As when it reached its climax, it sort of sp flowered outwards and then just slammed down to the city like a big wave of water, except for it was black and red flames, and it consumed the entirety of Averheim and killed everything inside of it except for Archeon himself. It burned the city to it burned Averheim to ash and absolutely obliterated it, and Ungrim claimed a mighty toll. And at the end of it all, King Ungrim Iron Fist, the last Slayer King, the Incarnate of Fire, had finally found his doom. And what a great doom it was. And that is the end of King Ungrim Iron Fist. Alright, now it's time for usually my favorite portion, where we get to just talk about Ungrim Iron Fist in Total War Warhammer. Uh, this time we've got this neat little image um, of some of his little abilities from within the game, which is the first time I've actually get, gotten to have one of these for this section. So let's go ahead and let's talk about what we've got here, and then we'll move on to kind of some other stuff. So, first of all, um, it is excellent that they have kept all of his abilities from tabletop and moved them into... Uh, Total War Warhammer. I'm super glad they've done this with most of the characters, and of course they've added little parts. Uh, Slayer King, um, giving all of the uh, Slayers in Ungrim's army a melee attack bonus, which is super awesome because it means that monster armies are just going to collapse. Um, for those of you, I'm sure many of you have seen the Thundering Falls videos where if those Slayers manage to get their hands on a giant, they just absolutely butcher it in no time. So it's awesome to think that with Ungrim and an army of Slayers, he will be able to just devastate uh, monstrous foes and maybe even allow Slayers to take on some other kinds of enemies um, despite their lack of armor. Uh, and this obviously combos really well with his uh, campaign bonus, which is if you take Ungrim Iron Fist, uh, he makes it, I can't remember if he either makes it easier to uh, recruit Slayers or he makes it so that the units are larger. I think it's so that it's easier to recruit. Uh, then he's got the Dragon Slayer ability, which we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, obviously, this gives him the good against large units rule, which is excellent because you'll be able to throw him against the likes of Kolex Sun Eater, and I bet Ungrim will actually come out on top. I'm very excited that we have a good old dwarf special uh, legendary lord who's going to be able to just run up to those big old monsters and just one-shot them. Well, not one-shot them, but close. Um, uh, I personally cannot wait to start breaking those um, irritating Arachnorok spiders with a few swings of the Axe of Dargo. Uh, that being said, um, I'm curious if Demon Slayer will also be implemented. 
Um, Dragon Slayer is only one half of the equation, um, but we'll see if Demon Slayer gets mixed in there. Uh, then we have Death Blow, which is that he uh, gets an absurd, absurd just bonus to just being super powerful. But it's provided that his health is high enough, which is kind of weird, because the way Death Blow works in tabletop is it's a Slayer special rule that when a Slayer dies, including Ungrim, they get to immediately make an attack. So, for instance, um, if you're fighting Kolek Sun Eater with Ungrim Iron Fist, and Kolek, and you do a bunch of wounds with uh, Iron Fist, but Kolek survives, and he swings and kills Iron Fist, Iron Fist can then immediately make another attack, um, which often brings down his enemy just through the sheer amount of damage he does. Um, the cool thing about this is uh, it's interesting that Death Blow. You figure it would work the reverse of that if his health was low enough he would get a bonus as you know he would get more frenzied or whatever that being said i like that they have an incentive to be careful with ungrim and not just throw him recklessly around without care for how much damage he's taking this will reward players obviously for playing more tactically with ungrim and throwing him in where you need him um because he's just if you throw him in at that higher health that increased attack strength and armor piercing is going to make him just absurdly good. I mean, comboing that with Dragon Slayer, um, he's going to just wreck those high armor units uh, in close combat, which is going to be so great. Uh, Miner's, Miner's Instinct. This one's pretty interesting. <laughs> Excuse me. As it doesn't really have a tabletop inspiration. Um, if anything, this is more of like a Joseph Bugman sort of thing. Um, but it's very fascinating that they made him exceptionally good at going through underground ways to surprise people. Um, this really doesn't have any relation to Ungrim's lore. He's never been particularly noted for using the Underway. Um, that being said, I completely welcome it. And I like that he's going to be based on more of a very fast... Um, s not a s aggressive approach, you know, where you want Thorgrim Grudgebearer to sort of march across the map, um, being a badass with super high leadership and helping your resource generation, all that stuff. Ungrim is just going to be the perfect character for hunting down armies and butchering people around your cities and just kicking ass and taking names. Uh, Lord of the Deeps, uh, uh, again, another buff for, for when he fights underground. Um, once again, very interesting, as Ungrim has very, very few noted underground battles. Um, if anything, of all the dwarves, he has the highest amount of above-ground battles that we have record of. Um, all of his famous battles have occurred under the open skies. Um, that being said, once again, perfectly welcome it. Um, it would be... It's interesting to see that rule on him as opposed to on um, King Belagar Ironhammer if he was ever added into the game. Lord of the Deep seems like it'd be something a bit more up his alley. But that being said, super excited that Ungrim's just going to be very, very... Um, he's going to reward players for going after greenskins because I imagine whenever those greenskins are going underground around you... Uh, he has a very high likelihood to be able to uh, fight them on his terms. Um, whether that's underground, so you get that Lord of the Deeps bonus, or um, above ground with the alert bonus, which the alert bonus, which is the last one they have put here, is that he's less likely to be ambushed. Which, of course, the best part about this means that whether you're traveling through the underway underground or traveling normally above, above, your chances of being uh, attacked by an enemy you don't want to fight are small, regardless of the setting, which is super awesome and exciting. Um, so, moving past this little page, um, ultimately, the way I hope that he works is that he is just an absurdly good, just amazing fighter. That Ungrim is the kind of character you have that, while your dwarves are holding the line... And, you know, you, 
you've got your slayers on your flank and your rear holding off giants and trolls, and you've got your war machines pummeling goblin hordes and all this stuff. Ungrims, your solution to when you see something like that Arachnorok spider that you know can be taken down, but it's require, going to require so much of your army to do so. You just take Ungrim and throw him at it, and he just goes and just uh, beats the living snot out of it. Or, you know, if a wyvern lands in the middle of your army, Ungrim's a great solution to that. Uh, I'm really excited for Ungrim Iron Fist. Uh, between all of y'all and me, I am tempted to do my first run-through with Ungrim. I think my first run-through will be with Thorgrim. But uh, Ungrim is... It's, it's a hard choice. Uh, that being said, uh, I look forward to seeing how his weapons will work. Um, considering that he has these traits as just abilities it's going to be really interesting to see what kind of buffs he gets from say the axe of dargo um and the slayer crown um as for his quest battles i really really hope we get something along the lines of the battle of broken leg gully to get the dragon cloak um of course there is absolutely zero confirmation that there are ogres in the game that being said, there might be. We don't know. Um, but even if it was a greenskin horde... Well, actually, yeah, that's a good point. The the the, the Battle of Broken Leg Gully was technically against um, Nashrak. It was a greenskin army with Ogre's help. So, yeah, so that should be a greenskin fight. So I'm almost... I'm really... I'm hoping and feel confident saying that we will get to actually play the Battle of Broken Leg Gully. And that's how you will earn your Dragon Cloak. Um, so that'll be the quest uh, battle for that. At least I hope that's the case. Uh, that being said, very excited for Ungrim. It's great that uh, he is kind of your monster killer character out of the eight legendary lords. Um, you know, Thorgrim being your super general, Karl Franz being a balance between fighting in general, Balthazar Gelt, super magic, um, and of course the list goes on. Um, and Grimgor, Ironhide, and Ungrim will probably have an interesting uh, dynamic, as uh, Grimgor seems to be much more of a get stuck in and just fight people for long periods of time, being super tough. Whereas it seems like Ungrim is going to be the most aggressive of the characters, um, though he specializes obviously against monsters. That being said, I think my number one matchup that I am so excited for between the Legendary Lords is going to be Ungrim versus Kolek Sun-Eater. Because in Tabletop, which I'm sure we'll do a battle of that very soon, that is a uh, pretty crazy matchup. That is very fun to watch. But uh, that's pretty much all I've got for Ungrim. Um, thankfully, since we have more of this information out, these Total War sections aren't as long because I'm not having to speculate quite as much um, since I've got some information like this page right in front of me. Uh, and we'll be talking, of course, more about the other characters and the information that's been released on them um, in a pretty upcoming video. Um, that should be coming fairly soon. Um, but yeah, that pretty much uh, wraps up that Total War section. So let's uh, go ahead and have a few words about some other stuff, and then we'll be done. I hope you guys enjoyed this video on King Ungrim Iron Fist. Uh, I want to take a moment to say thank you to all of my patrons who I have listed right up here. Um, their support is what's allowed me to do a lot of really cool things that are coming in the future. Like, there's a Twitch channel coming soon. Thanks to their support, I was able to get a new graphics card. And when my computer started dying very recently, they have uh, been very awesome in assisting me in uh, getting a new uh, hard drive. So, um, once again, just want to take a moment to say thank you so much to my five patrons. Um, you're going to be seeing their names in every video from now on um, and down in the description. If you're interested in having your name added to this list or having some of the other perks, like they're going to get to watch this video uh, for a good probably five hours before it comes out for everyone else, um, feel free to check out the Patreon page and see what kind of incentives we've got there. Uh, in any event, thanks everyone so much for your patience. I had a rather nasty sinus infection that put me out for about two weeks, um, and I know a lot of people have been wondering where I am, but I'm back. We're back into it. There's some very exciting things coming in the future. I've got some really cool videos, and I am starting to do my first recordings of a few video games, so I hope you guys are all looking really forward to that. 
Um, thanks so much for all your support. It's been super fun. I'm so glad to be back. Um, I don't get sick very often, so hopefully that doesn't happen anytime again soon. That was awful. Uh, that being said, um, welcome back to the channel. It's a new year. We're getting started. We're getting off uh, to a great start. Uh, I hope all of you guys um, are doing well. And feel free to let me know how you're doing down in the comment section below. Let me know what kind of stuff y'all want to see. Um, there are other things coming in the near future. Uh, my patrons will be taking votes on some of the things you're going to be seeing next. So once again, if you're interested in getting to decide that, link's in the description below. In any event, thank you all so much for watching. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I love you all very much. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for watching, and have a good night.